My name is Max Wild. Uh, we started this school, Nacho and I, about a month ago, so this is all brand new. This is our second masterclass. Um, two weeks ago we had John Selway, who did an amazing masterclass on techno fundamentals. That was part one. Part two will be happening in, in January, so you should check out, look out for that. Um, we offer Ableton courses, uh, Logic courses, mixing and mastering, uh, songwriting, and uh, synthesis for musicians. And uh, yeah, you can find all that information on the website. Adam is one of our teachers. Yes. And uh, so is John Selway, Abe Duque, who's going to be giving a master class in two weeks on mixing and mastering. So uh, we're, we're trying to bring back a lot of our colleagues from uh, Dubspot and find a new home for Dubspot. Um, we also, if you are interested, we're going to give a tour after to show you the space and come see us for um, discounts. We are offering a discount to anyone that came today. That being said, uh, I've known Adam for a long time. In fact, I was sitting in his class at some point at Dubspot, and uh, he is a master of uh, many things, but um, especially, I just spit, <laughs> what's that? I just fiddle around. You know. fiddle around. Uh, but no, he's, I've actually, he's come even, Though he was a master when I met him, he's becoming more of a master and he's added all these new instruments to his arsenal and which just goes to show that as a musician you can just keep growing and growing and keep adding new things and discovering new ways to create the sound that you're looking for. So without further ado, please welcome Adam Partridge, Atropolis. Thank you, Max. All right, let's get started. I'm going to talk some more, and then we're going to listen, and then some more talking. Um, this is a photo of me playing at the World Music uh, Festival in Chicago in 2014. Uh, this was the first gig that um, a promoter was like, we want you to do a live set. Uh, I was a DJ. I'm still, I still DJ, but not nearly. I was DJing like twice a week for maybe about two years, and I was getting a lot of gigs, and it took me, you know, took me around, uh, but it, for me, it, there was just something missing. I've been a live musician my whole life, um, and there was just something that I, I was like, oh, I just want to like perform my music. I don't want to just like rely on other people's music. Although there's a beauty for those of you who are DJs, there is a beauty of turning someone onto something that they never heard of. You know, that's the most satisfying thing. That's what I live for as a DJ. Is you find this track that you're like. Oof. No one knows about it, you share it, and it's just really exciting to pass that on. Uh, so I still have that passion, but parallel to that, I also really love performing, and uh, this was the beginning to my um, searching of how to do this. And I learned quickly that there's not a tremendous amount of information. This was three years ago, there's more out there. Um, and I also learned that it's a very custom, very individual process of how your setup's gonna come to life and how you're gonna approach things. Ultimately, uh, Ableton Live might be the thing that we all are sharing and using. Maybe not, maybe you won't use Ableton Live. Ableton Live, the software is actually called Live. It's made by a company called Ableton. A lot of people call it Ableton, it's actually called Live. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up, it was created in 2001. And the main catalyst to Ableton Live was for performance. You had these guys, these uh, techno DJs in, in Germany who wanted to uh, do more than the limitations of DJing. They wanted to have control over all their elements. So that was the origins of Ableton Live. And still today, of course, it's now progressed into more of a production tool. Uh, but it is incredibly powerful. I would say Ableton Live is the most proficient when using it live. I've never. I've never had Ableton Live crash on me when performing. Maybe today it will happen, but I'm, I'm pretty, pretty impressed with how well it runs um, when you're performing with it. So, what is a live set? This can be de determined differently and seen differently by a lot of people. Uh, there's a journalist in New Zealand that I'm thinking of, uh, this guy Martin, that uh, works with Boiler Room. Um, other organizations, uh, Thump and Vice, and you know we're getting into this kind of heated topic of what a live set is, you know, because 
it's kind of like, all right, uh, I'm just triggering a couple things and working with controllers. Some people will be like, oh, that's not live. You're not actually like recording music. Some people think that a live set should be, everything is live and you're playing every single instrument live. Uh, for me, a live set is, is, is the extension of an electronic musician. Okay, we're, we're dealing with things that might not necessarily have been composed 100% live, and there's really no other way to perform it than triggering the sample. Uh, so for me, a live set can encompass a combination of either one, just working with sound and manipulating the sound as it is. Okay, and I'm, I'm highlighting that because, baby, we're not all musicians. I think that's why we gravitate. At least for me, I, I've been a musician uh, since the age of eight, but it's not my strength. You know, I like to produce, I like to compose, I love to play instruments, but I'm not making money by playing the piano or playing the guitar. I'm not a studio musician. Um, Ableton Live is able to kind of allow me to express myself the way I want to. For me, I felt very limited to one instrument, which is why I can't stay true to one instrument. Um, so live set can encompass just manipulating sound. It can be a combination of performing and working with pre-recorded sounds. Um, so, and then sometimes you can maybe have elements of DJing. DJing is disc jockey. Uh, just because you're triggering samples doesn't make you a DJ. You're not necessarily playing other people's music in full form. Uh, you might just be playing your own kind of samples uh, in its own form. Okay, so there are techniques that are drawn from DJing that I'll be sharing with you today. So I'm, I'm just going to kind of do a, some, some kind of, uh, you're going to see some examples of the live set. I apologize for the, um, the lighting here right now. I, I, I know we can't see this too well, but we're going to see a, a few examples of different live setups. And the first example is going back to uh, Jamaica. Uh, we're going to look at Mad Scientist real quick. So one of the controllers that I'm working with is the DS1 which was actually developed by DubSpot with Livid. I believe you can't buy these anymore. That's what everyone keeps on telling me. So I don't know. Um, I don't know if you can find this. If you can, if you can, if you're looking to get this, anyone know about this and is like, I want one? Call Livid, give them a shout. They, 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 they might just build one for you. Anyway, the reason I'm bringing up dub music, um, we're gonna see an example this, this right here is one of the foundations, in my opinion, to like the beginning of thinking about performing music in a totally different way. And when we go back to like 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, where you have these engineers in Jamaica essentially taking all the stems. The stem could be the individual part of the song. So let's say we have a full reggae song, we got a guitar, that would be one stem, a drum, that would be another stem, vocals, keys. Let's say we have four stems. Uh, dub artists will then take those and control and manipulate the way those stems are interacting. And they're generally working with time-based effects, delays and reverbs. And they're working with sends and returns, uh, which I will get more in depth. I'll briefly talk about it now. And if you're, not, if you're still not hip to it, don't worry, I'll get more into it. A send and return allows you to send a channel, let's say a guitar, to a delay. On that delay is a return. So you're sending the guitar to that return, and in return you're getting a delay. So let's take a listen real quick. Let's take a look real quick. <laughs> back to Jamaican dub music. And a lot of my techniques, a lot of the things that I'm doing is drawing 
from that way of working where I have this mixer, I'm taking my elements, and I work with only time-based effects for my transitions. And I'll be sharing with you those time-based effects that I use to do like washed out reverbs, a pitch delays, and things like that, okay? All right. Getting a little bit more intense. And you guys know younger, this, this guy is like, right now I started with some keys, just looped it, just moving to his guitar. So live, live, everything's live right now. But guess what? Those drums, he didn't make those live, he triggered them, right? So there's only so much we can do. Okay, so is he using foot pedals or he's, he's he's using foot pedals. Okay, this is my foot pedal. I'm using the push two, and this is going into channel two. This is like a fourteen dollars, the cheapest thing that I have with me here, um, and I just punch in and punch out. It's awesome. So I can record, punch in, punch out, and he's literally punching in, punching out on everything. Um, the reason these, these next two artists, uh, French Kiwi Juice, these guys are both kind of doing an interaction with live and triggering samples. I find that to be probably the most common thread with live sets, is there's some element of live, whatever that instrument is that you perform on that you feel comfortable, that's, that's what you're going to be worth. And then maybe there's other things that are more complex, um, or just you're not, you're just one person, so you've got to definitely think about organizing and creating stems and how you want to trigger those things it becomes a little confusing. So this guy is kind of cool. French kiwi juice, anyone know French kiwi juice? Serious. Have you got the screen phone? Yeah. Sample. He's working with the APC 40 right there. He just punched in his drum. He just punched in his uh, looping. He's, I don't think he's working with pedals. I think he's actually just. Looks like he's doing it. Him. And now just getting into the production. That's that dub delay that I'm a huge fan of. Can't get rid of that. So his whole style, even the controller. Dating back to dub reggae. Got two more examples, Carl Cox. You know, for him, he got some hardware. Yeah. It's a little hard to see things. He has a Mo Voyager here. This is a boiler room set. And there's very few moments that he actually touches that thing. He's actually just running clips, MIDI clips, into these different pieces of hardware. Some of them he's playing, some of them he's running clips into them. So I'll, I'll show you if you're using hardware like a synthesizer, maybe you're not necessarily playing it, but you can like program stuff and run it into the synth. So we'll, we'll start talking a little bit about that. So I just want to share uh, Carl Cox's setup. Carl, you know, Carl Craig? Huh? Carl Craig, oh, sorry. Uh, Just, thank you. Exactly. He wasn't chubby enough. What's that? He wasn't chubby enough. I was like, no. Yeah, what's, that? Right what's going on? <laughs> this is the main keyboard. He's got some synths over here. He's got, um, I think, the machine. 
mostly playing this way, he's running MIDI clips into this. It's working as a sound engineer, uh, engineer, not necessarily performing it physically. A lot of gear in all these examples. The last example is this guy, Arab Music. You can just be a one, you know, this guy's just one, one, one tool. I'm sure you'll see a lot of these guys as one, this is a sampler, okay? So for me, what I'm using, laptop, I got my DS1 mixer, cool. This I'm using for my volumes, for my sends and returns, uh, for my audio effect processing. I have my push too, I'm using this for triggering my samples, for recording, for changing my tempo, um, for selecting my channels, okay. The APC40, which was uh, what the French Kiwi Juice was using. That's kind of a, a fusion of both of these things together. Um, again, it's down to personal taste, budget, you know, what, what, what can you get and, and what you like. Uh, I'm working with the Prophet 6. Uh, this has been a new addition to my setup. I'm not sure if I'm gonna keep it in my live setup just because of the costliness and weight of this thing. Um, but I, I really like playing the piano and I like just having these controls up front. In terms of what's happening in my Ableton template, I'm just working with drums, percussion, uh, minimal vocals, and, and effects. I have one audio input, which is my Prophet 6. I'm not using an external instrument, but I'm going to show you guys what an external instrument does. Anyone working with hardware or synths or anything like that? Okay. So if you have a, a synthesizer, an analog or, or digital, you can pretty much communicate and send MIDI messages to it um, and have it kind of perform on its own like a computer. Now, this setup has changed. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you this setup, but for those, I know some of you guys are gonna be on like a microphone and things like that. Um, you know, I don't have a microphone with this setup right now. Um, Second. But just to give you a little, little thing before we get into it. Uh, where is it? That's, um, oh, I guess I didn't render that. Can I open this anyway? Yeah. So just real quick, I just, the reason I want to share this just a little bit. This was my previous setup. Drum pad, Gaita, Colombian flute. Okay, same concept. Like this is, I'm not working with a microphone, but it's the same concept. I have my Prophet 6, that's my line in. So everything that I'm doing today, like you can change, you can add. Um, and if, if you're someone who needs a microphone, just pretend my Prophet 6, like just imagine your microphone acting as a line in. One of the reasons, I, I'm not going to say I wouldn't go back to that setup, it was just a time in my life that I was really into that instrument, um, and I was working with drums, and um, it's like things were, are going to grow and change, okay? This, this setup is going to grow and change over time. Uh, there were things that I was doing with my template that I'm not doing anymore. My template used to be huge. I used to utilize all eight channels. Today I'm only utilizing four channels. I'm not saying I won't go back to eight. I just kind of simplified the way I was organizing things. Um, initially, I used to organize my live set and, and cut down my productions to like eight stems. And I would have control over all those stems. Over time, I realized the moments that I'm doing the most with like performance is um, in transitions, whether it's the beginning of my songs or the end of the songs. 
And I felt that the thing that I really need control of was the moments of percussion in all the tracks. And then everything else, um, I can like kind of take in and take out whenever I want. So what, do, what does that mean? Well, let me, let me put that to some sound. Uh, let's see. OK, so let me just show you. My live set. Man. I guess. There's no way we can make this more <coughs> visible, is there? Maybe can you guys have it? Maybe if we pull the whole projector. Yeah, it doesn't go, it doesn't go all the way down. It doesn't go all the way down. No, we have, we have, we're, we're working on it. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's okay. So I, I mentioned that I, I kind of simplified. This is. Uh, let me just open up the right thing real quick. So this is just a mini, just a little kind of presentation of what I'm going to be getting into. Um, so the first thing getting into this is, is building a template. Okay, you're, you're going to need a template. The template is this. A template is where you're going to be opening up, organizing whatever it is that you're doing. In this case, I have my stems. The stems are the individual parts of the songs. And each color represents a different song. Um, and a different part of those songs. And I mentioned in the beginning I used to have control over all of my elements, but I, over time I decided that I just really need the drum parts of those songs. That gives me the most freedom. Tonally, that gives me the most freedom to transition and things like that. So it really depends on what you're doing. I work with world music. I work with global bass. So a lot of my music might interact with a live uh, instrumentalist that I recorded. Um, I most likely won't have, you know, depending on the gig or depending on where I am, I'm not going to have that instrumentalist with me, so I'm going to be working with that sound only through what I have. Maybe you guys are going and gigging, you have that instrumentalist with you on that gig and not another day. So you got to start kind of thinking about what it is that you need with you and what don't you need. That's been something that I will continue to change and grow. So right now, with my setup, the things that I'm really focusing on are just percussion parts. Percussion parts, what do I mean by percussion parts? So these are like my different percussion parts from two different tracks. This would be like one percussion. Those are my vocals. So this is from one track. And this is another percussion group from another track. So two different percussion sections from two different tracks. For me, rhythm has always been kind of the foundation of all my music. Um, I always get inspired. If I have a nice drum beat, a nice drum kit, uh, that usually will lead to other things. This segment that I'm sharing with you that I'm going to perform in a little bit is um, kind of an improvisation that I came up with with my uh, live set that I did a few months ago at the Knockdown Center. Um, and the reason I want to share with you is because when I was getting into a live set, I was under the impression like you're really stuck. Like you're going to, as a DJ, someone who can like read the crowd and be like, all right, I'm going to, I'm too fast or too slow or this is not the right vibe. Speaking the DJ language out there for those of you who are DJs, you know, you could quickly adjust to reading the room. Um, as a live performance, it's a little bit different. Okay, it's not like you're trying to appease the crowd. and It's not like you can just jump and change things quickly. But there is more freedom than you think. And in terms of that freedom and what it can lead to, in terms of inspiration, maybe as a platform to create other things, uh, this is like a little jam session that I came across while preparing for my live set. Um, so there are things, there are spontaneous moments that can happen in a live set that are really cool. And that's the kind of the moment that I capture and I'm gonna share right here. And this live, um, this improvisation kind of, now it's like organizing, like a little set jam, came through the inspiration and the transition between the green and the purple, which comes through two different, completely different tracks. So let me share these tracks, uh, just a little bit of these tracks real quick so you can hear them in their full form. 
and then I'll show you what I extracted from these two tracks. Um, let's go over here. Is my jump? There it is. Okay, so this is um, one track that I'm working with the materials and stems. Talented accordion player from Sao Paulo, and this is another track um, where I worked with this incredible guy to player from Bogota. Everything from those full tracks of everything I just extracted. Um, you know, these are just the rhythm sections. This is from the recording. This is in a transition, and this is some of the percussion towards the end. And I felt like rhythm just gives me the option to go anywhere. As long as I got rhythm, I can put anything on top of it. So that's kind of my my current situation. Uh, where I really strip down what is happening uh, with the programming versus what is happening with the performance. <coughs> okay, so just to kind of like recap that whole conversation, uh, we're talking about creating a template. Okay, that's the starting point. You need a template, and then you have to figure out what it is that you want to organize. Um, seems like most of us play some kind of instrument. Does anyone not play an instrument? How about that? Okay, so you know, manipulating the sound for sound's sake. No, no, that's that's. I, I'm not even trying. This is an instrument. The computer, you do play an instrument. The laptop is an instrument. Okay, um, I don't want anyone to think if you don't play an instrument that you can't do a live set. Um, you totally can. I, I will give you a, a little preview of, of how you can just work with sound in the sound's sake. So, um, musician or not musician, you have a song. Okay, if you're not a musician, what elements of those songs, what parts of the songs do you want to mess with? And that's what you're going to want to capture and organize and put here. In your productions, you might, I'm just curious, how many, how many tracks do you have in one production usually? Uh, uh, that gives it away. Yeah. 30? Two, 200. 200? Uh, not that much, but like anywhere from probably like 40 to Yeah, yeah, that's pretty standard. Okay, so it's not, we're not going to fit 40 to 100 things on here. Okay, so we're talking about the first step, and that's building a template and then organizing whatever it is that you're making. Uh, average track, I mean, maybe you're minimal and cool. I, I'm trying to be minimal and cool and like just make music with like three things. They say that the ear can only focus on three things, so just food for thought. If you're ever overwhelmed by your productions and you have a lot going on, then it sounds weak. Probably, probably got too much going on. Regardless, when you're building a template, the limitations of your template are usually set by the controller that you decided to invest in. And in that case, I'm a big advocate for the push. I'm gonna just keep on picking this up and putting it down. Um, this thing has eight by eight, okay? Eight by eight. So those are my, those are my opportunities to, to, or my limitations to what I can do. And that's why in the beginning I literally started with eight stems. I would have uh, drums, percussion one, percussion two, bass, uh, lead harmony synth, lead harmony synth, effects. Actually, I had seven channels. The eighth channel would be my live stuff. Okay, so you need you need to kind of figure out. All right, I need a controller. Um, what is my control? Some controllers only have four by four. So how can you organize and, and optimize whatever that controller is? Yeah. So those like 40 to 100 tracks get... Uh, you gotta condense them. Yes. Yeah. What does that look like? Uh, 
Good question. So, a over uh, here. Oh no, I don't have that one. Let's do this one. So you got to categorize your 40 to 800, 40 to 100 tracks by instrumentation, okay? Whatever that may be, like a synth, harmony, leads, drums, you know, all your drums. Maybe you have 20 tracks just for drums. That should maybe just be one thing, right? Uh, you have like seven synth lines layering each other. That should be one thing. I'm going to show you what that looks like. Okay, so that Geiger track, uh, the, the, the flute, okay, this is the, the entire production, right? It's, um, it is roughly 99 tracks, which is stupid. Um, of those 99 tracks, right, you can see I have my different kicks. How many kicks do I have? One, two, three, four, five. How many bass things do I have? One. These are all my drums. That's going to come and break down. Let's go down here. These are my stems. I work with analog when I'm mixing, so I have to print all my stuff. So all of those uh, 99 tracks are then, these are my stems. You know, these are my drums. I put my kick snare together. I put my percussion together. I put my bass and my guitar. So I created four stems out of 80 tracks. Instrumentation. Organize your stems by instrumentation. Is, anyone, is that clear? Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, please. No, I, I don't understand. What is a stem? A stem. So a stem, this, this is, um, so the stem that's widely known is basically the individual, so in this case, I have 99 tracks. Let's say I have four kick drums going on. A stem would be those four kick drums put into one channel. So I export those four kick stems. I'm not taking four channels of kicks. I'm taking up four channels of precious space. I'm going to export those four kicks into one, and now it's a stem. Okay, maybe I have a string ensemble. Violin one, violin two, cello, viola, whatever. Let's do one more. Uh, what else we got? I'm no. So let's just say strings. Five. No, no, I don't want to get there. A, ten, a bass, a stand-up bass, five things. I'm not going to take those five. I'm going to export those five things into strings, and that could be now one thing. That would be a stem. Okay. Uh, Who's talking? Okay. Um, so you kind of confused me. I know that you just, in session view, you can put each uh, drum pattern, each different drum pattern, to uh, your push. column yeah. section. Uh, but when you take each loop from different sample base, uh, basses or guitars or whatever, and you put it into the same track, doesn't it change the composition of the, of the sound of all of them? If, you, if you're taking... Um, because you're just taking the MIDI from what you played and taking the sound from that track and just applying it to the, that MIDI that you you're, you're not changing anything, you're just uh, condensing. Okay. You're condensing. Um, so whatever that sound is, nothing's changing. MIDI or, or audio, you're, you're the best way to look at it, if you only have one thing of each, then you're fine. You just exp export one of those things. But usually we have a lot of layers of, for one thing. You know, we'll have like four kit snare sounds. Yeah, drive. You know, yeah, we'll have a lead, might have like a high, uh, octave up, octave down, zero. One's distorted, one's not. So kind of like putting those all together. Um, it's not going to change the composition. But what, what it is changing, this actually, I'm trying to still kind of understand the question. Um, there is a part of organization, Anthony, that comes after. So like you organize your stems, you export your stems, and you've got to think about intro, verse one, hook one, break, hook two. How you're going to organize the sections is another thing. Um, like the middle of the song. Yeah beginning of the song stuff. Yeah. Like uh, and fillers. And so, yes, so, yes, yes, all of those things. Does anyone else have any any other questions? Anthony, does that answer your question? You, you, you're you all right there? I feel, like it's, I feel like I didn't quite answer your question. I think I know what you meant. Yeah. I was trying to get clarity for, for her and 
I kind of got a little bit confused myself, and then it turned into what we were talking about. So what do, do you mean that like if you have if you have a MIDI track, you're putting an instrument on it, you're putting effects on it, exactly. and then if you grouped all those MIDI sequences together, then you're going to have just one set of effects. Oh, you have to export the MIDI to audio, as audio, right? That's yeah, every, well, that's why. MIDI or audio, it's going to come out as audio. Unless you want to manipulate the MIDI. That, that's, a whole other, that's a whole other situation. Um, if you want to do that. Stems. Where, oh, I have a question. So, yeah. what are, so what are the four stems? In, in, my, in this situation, I didn't want to go, like... What I was sharing is I, I used to do all the stems to all the, all the individual parts. Uh, for me, I decided what, it, what do I want to focus on performance-wise. The first stages of my life set, I had too much control and spent too much time like programming how my sequence would go. And now I kind of just stripped it down and I, I'm literally just working with four things. My four things are a combination of the full track and its beauty. Uh, that's professionally mixed, uh, professionally mastered, so it has this nice feel to it. And then stems from those tracks, and those stems from the tracks are only the drums, the percussion parts. So it just keeps on, it's keeps on cutting in and out. HDMI. No one. Is. Can you put this in straight? Yeah. In the concern of how you're consolidating your stems, you might, if, if you don't want those things to be one, because you want to control this one and you want to control that one, these are the choices that you're going to have to make. Okay, if you have a complicated melody, maybe you have a counterpart, one melody is going up, one melody is going down, you want to control the melody that's going up and control the melody. You would have two stems opposed to one. Okay, so. That's, these are things like first sit down, figure out if you're going to have a controller. Maybe you don't. Maybe it's just your laptop. You could literally just use your laptop. I'm not going to do that, but you can. You can, you can trigger with your mouse. You, know, you see guys on stage. You see performers on stage. You ever see someone on the stage with a mouse? It's like the worst for me. I just, it's scary. It's so weird. Bass nectar, man. I've seen him with a mouse. Magabo, anyone know Magabo from Brazil? He came and wants to just be using the mouse. It's funny. He's like sitting down, <laughs> writing a paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, that's the Zoom. Adam, I have another question. Yeah, so please. You're using mainly audio tracks because you have to obviously bounce or consolidate your 99 tracks to a couple of stems. Yes. But then uh, you're losing control because they're all audio, so you can't manipulate well, any MIDI. Right? Yeah. So do you have any MIDI tracks besides the live tracks that you might be playing live? This is all going to boil down to style and genre of music. Um, I'm not going to single out techno and just like electronic music, but maybe if you are like synth based, module based, you're, and, and maybe your, your performance is all about tweaking knobs and things, you probably are going to want your MIDI. Right. You know, it depends on your performance. I work with this world music and uh, low budgets where maybe, you know, I can't get all the musicians I want, so I don't really have a choice, nor do I really care uh, to control my MIDI. I don't need to, I don't need to control my MIDI. Um, I didn't lose control, I mean, I did lose control, like, for example, like that accordion, for example. Two years ago, I would just have that accordion by itself, so I can do dubbed out things. Uh, now I'm keeping all, all one because I'm only focusing in the beginning and the end or the middle sections, the beginning, middle, and end. Any point when there's a transition is where I can find myself like really changing things. Um, so I decided that performance wise, I want to really try to control and open up the possibilities with, with what I'm doing live rather than too concerned about. Um, basically there's a battle between like what you're programming and what you want to do. Is, is a conversation that I'm constantly having, and it's a conversation that you're going to constantly have. It's like, what do you, and that's only, the only way you're going to experience and figure that out is by doing it. Okay, so starting out with a template, starting out with a controller, taking your track and organizing it. Um, what are we doing on time? I'm going to perform in a little bit, and then I will just kind of briefly show you how I'm exporting my track out to kind of demystify this whole stemming process and organizing. Okay?
Any questions? Any other questions so far? Okay. Template, controller, organizing your songs. In this case, I only have like two elements going on. Um, I'm going to do a little performance and I'll talk about it. You're more than welcome to stand up if you want to come and just see what's happening here. You're also welcome to just sit and drink out of red cups. I don't know what you guys are drinking, man, but no, I'm joking. But yeah, if you want to come up here and look, you can if, if you want to hang out. But by all means, Before you do that, can yeah. you just briefly play your different steps so you can play? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. So this says full track, and immediately I'm lying to you uh, <laughs> because I just have some ambient sound. I love rain. Max was like, what's that white noise? Is something broken? I'm like, oh, it's, it's rain sample. OK, so. Is it sampled, or is it something that you just uh, had from a pack or something? Yeah, I combined like five different atmospheric samples that I got on Splice. Any Splice users in here? Yeah. Splice should also be hooking me up. S-P-L-I-C-E. Splice is the future. It's probably going to be in the history books, like in 100 years. And like. Splice came out and homogenized the music production process because now everyone has these stems and making the same music. Quick side note, anyone taking a class here will get an automatic membership at Splice. That's part of what we offer. So we have a partnership with Splice right now. Oh, nice. um, and uh, yeah, it's a really handy tool for getting amazing samples. samples. And it, the, the best part about it is that you now can search by just typing in keywords rather than scrolling through thousands and thousands of samples, you can just yeah. kind of type in certain search parameters and, and find stuff really quickly. So, and it's all in the cloud. They're the first that I've experienced that have such, now other companies are hopping and making it as, they're so well organized. You just, it's the best interface. You get a little app, okay? We're talking about what are these samples. I, I did not buy a plane ticket and fly to the Amazon and record this stuff, I wish I did. Uh, but I didn't. Instead, I went on the internet. This is the Splice app. I'm not on the internet right now, and it's just awesome. It organizes according to instrumentation. Um, if you're into film, um, you have a huge archive of folly sounds and cool cinematic sounds. Um, there's a lot. So check out Splice for samples. Yeah. Um, so I've used Splice, and I have several friends that use Splice as well, and they, some of them tell me you should EQ them, some of them say you don't okay. need them. Yeah, that's, that's they, a really... They come, they come you know, like yeah. as is. They're yeah. already really good. You don't have to do any effects to it at all. Yeah, that's What's the, your take on no, that? No, no, no. That's, that's a really, another really great question. Uh, every, mostly every sound on Splice has been professionally mixed and mastered, and, and they're super pristine. Uh, EQing, I could go back and forth. Usually it's compression that people get into with these things. So they're usually pretty compressed and pretty beefy and have a lot. The, the simple answer to your question is whatever sounds good is good. Okay. End of, the, end of story. Don't not do something because someone says you don't have to do it because they already did it. Right. You try it out and say, hey, this, this is working for my track. You know, I do find, like sometimes first place, like for a kick drum, like I actually want to find a non-process kick. Yeah. You know, because all the kicks are like super crazy, and if I want to spice it up, put a touch of compression, if something's already super processed, you're, you're going to hear it. Yeah. Especially I, with compression. They, whenever I choose, like, I, I'll choose maybe one or two stems that I, I won't use the whole splice right. for my whole track. Maybe just yeah, like, yeah, you little, know, a little, snare here, yeah, there's exactly. shakers, yeah. whatever it is. But it, it, you could tell, you know, I'll sit on the other tracks for a while to make it match. Right. The crispiness or whatever the roundedness of that sound that I get yeah. from Splice because the quality of what I'm downloading from there is so much better. Right. Well, not better, it's just I have to now catch up with the stems that I have no. open yeah. or tracks that I have open and make my thing stand out because I'll play, I have like a small innovation and then and Machine MK2 yes. and then I'm on Pebble yes. and then Voice. Nice. So like that's what I have in my mind. Yeah. But, uh, I don't play piano that much. That's why I got my ass kicked at school. But um, no, so I want to launch from all those. It's very percussive. But um, yeah, I just feel like sometimes this, some, some of the sounds you'll be like, whoa, that's like very crisp and very nice. And then some of the other sounds, it's like, 
That's, yeah. that's very broad and wavy and kind of like cinematic. It depends on the producer. Like for me, I have a lot of Brazilian packs. Some of the guys, whoever made it, some are doing a really great job. Some are doing a horrible job. And you can hear it. Yeah, you have to navigate how it's going to fit into your sonic space. End of the day, whatever sounds right, it's right. If it sounds good without nothing, that's it. There's nothing right. wrong with that. Uh, but don't be afraid to touch it. Okay. In terms of using samples, I'll get to you in a minute. In terms of using samples, if um, for me as a live musician, as a composer, I definitely would be like, ooh, you know. Anyone else feel that way? This what using is, samples. What do you mean? Well, I'll tell you, like using uh, a sample, a loop. No, no. Okay, that's great. So <laughs> if you feel, I'm, I'm basically kind of maybe talking from my own journey. It might apply to. Um, if, as a producer, you need something, you're going to have to then hire that musician, yeah. go to a studio, book the studio, he's going to be like 150 for three hours, the studio's going to be, you know, you're going to drop three, That's $400, dollars, which is cool, <laughs> and you can do that if you really need something specific, or you might find something quick. Same, same idea, yeah. you know, you need a, a bossa nova rhythm, you go on here, you get it, and record it, it's the same concept. Um, good, yes. I, I don't care. Yeah, I don't care. I'm a hater, but not on Splice. I'm a hater on the haters who hate on Splice. No, I don't know what's what's going on. I'm actually curious. What are what are the haters saying? Like, don't use samples. Build everything yourself. Yeah, yeah. So I personally love using Splice. Yeah. Um, I do have some friends who kind of like look down on people who use Splice. Um, so I think it's just Yeah, I mean, there, there's a common, it depends what you're doing. Um, there are guys that I worked with at Dove Spot that are killing it, and like in, in what's it called, like Dub Techno, or I don't know, some, Alan Neves, any of Alan Neves from Dove Spot, he's, he's doing some great things. His music is 100% everything, is sample based, and he's out there touring. Um, so if someone wants to have an opinion about that, great, but he's doing his thing. For me, I wouldn't want to build an entire song just from samples. I'll, I'll have my original ideas and I'll use samples like percussion or something like that. Uh, it depends. It really depends. If, if I think in the beginning, in terms of the progress of producing, I think everyone's going to start with working with samples, right? And building whole tracks. I mean, the entire genre of hip hop is entirely based on sampling. Uh, Hotline Bling. Drake. That's an old one. I felt like I feel like it just like hurt everybody. That was a sample, man. That's a whole thing, you know. That's like there's a lot of other songs, but that was a sample. That entire song is based on a sample from 1972. You know, so sampling is a huge part of mainstream music. So at the end of the day, if you're doing it, making it, and you're happy, don't worry about what people are saying. Yeah. Any 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 other concerns on the topic of sampling? As long as you give the artists credit, I think you can use any piece of material. Well, okay, yeah, I mean, on sampling, if you're sampling stuff on Splice, it's all royalty free. You don't have to give anyone anything. If you're taking something from like an entire song that's been sold, then you're going to have to pay. Or if it's a unique sound from a record that. Yeah, hear. yeah, something that's very distinct and noticeable, uh, you're going to have to say something. Does that also go for like a. Yeah, if you're pulling stuff, you know, at the end of the day, if, if you're getting like 100 hits in a month, you're, you're going to be fine. No one's going to come out. It's really until you start hitting viral status that people are going to come after you. The Harlem Shake, also another kind of, you know, thing that's come and gone. If you don't know about it, uh, stand up and I'd like to shake your hand. That'd be awesome. And it's okay. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, come here. No, no, no. The Harlem Shake was out for about two years. No one cared. Didn't matter, and then it went viral, and then that's when the lawyers came after them, and that's when the money had to get exchanged, and that's where the lawsuit happened, and that's where like a four hundred thousand dollar payout had to happen. So you can get away with things if you're selling, if you're going to get signed, if any of you guys are going to get signed, the record label, the first thing they're going to ask you are all these samples clear, and if they're not, they can help you do that. So if you have something from a movie clip, you're going to sell it. It's going to go on a distribution. It's going to go on iTunes, um, and it's being released. Legally, then you're, you're going to have to do something about it. But if you're just posting it for free, 
or whatever, you, you can get away. Even posting it for free, I've ran into a it problem. Depends on the size of the artist. Oh, yeah, it's definitely. Like, it sounds like it's down all the time. Yeah, even posting on Facebook, yeah, like, yeah I know. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna I'm gonna play these stems, and then and then we're gonna get see a little performance. So this is one thing. This is another. These are maracas that I recorded. I'm not actually using this. Okay. That's the this one. Right here. Got my fingers broken. That's this one. elements and what I'm about to do. Okay, so I'm going to do a little uh, performance with this. Suggestion to those of you who are going to be performing, uh, maybe you have a controller like this. Um, just a tip, this might be a little bit more advanced. Just make sure you set your controller up before you start. Okay, like I have a lot of stuff on here. I have a lot of things. My faders might not be in the right place. Um, I have a lot of marks uh, that are telling me where my delays are, where my feedback percentages are, where my pitches, where my volumes. So before you start, there might be a lot of things. You might not have this, but for my own self, this is something I have to remind myself. I gotta check everything before I start so it's not a disaster. So I'm gonna do that first. I'm gonna set everything up. I'm only using four channels today. Um, one channel is just for audio, uh, like a ambient sound. Channel one's for ambient rain sound. Channel two and three are drums, and channel four is my Prophet Six. Okay. All right. Cool. Tempo. I got my. Foot switch, that this is what I'm going to be using to punch in and punch out my looping that I'm going to be doing on my profit, on my keyboard. Cool. Anyone know like John Cage? Four, I'm going to do four minutes and uh, what's this song where he doesn't do anything? It's just silence. It's four minutes and 13 seconds. You remember the name? What's the name? It's a four minutes and 13 seconds. He literally comes on. And, and nothing. I mean, he has sheet music that just says don't play. Adam, can you show us your effects rack on the monster? I'm going to do that when, uh, when we recap. Oh, wait, or, yeah. Yeah, so that's I mean, you're not going to see it when I'm moving around, unfortunately, because Ableton doesn't do the best job uh, right. with that stuff. Um, but I will get into more detail. We're, we are running out of time. Uh, this is my delay, where I'm using echo. No, I mean, you don't have to go. Yeah, yeah I'm just a little, little quick thing. And I'm just using reverb with an echo after it. So those are my two returns. Right?
terms of that discussion of checking everything, um, I have a different audio interface at home. I mean, I, I use this for my live performance, and I forgot, I quit my uh, Ableton Live template. I didn't save it, and I forgot to switch my input of my keyboard. So basically, the, imp the thing that I just recorded was going to loop. That didn't record because I completely, this is my own, my own mistake, and luckily, I'm at a workshop where I can just yeah. stop and say, hey, guess what? I screwed up. Um, so I have my profit. It's an audio channel. And the profit uh, at home is going into channel 7 and 8. And today it's not going in 7 and 8. It's going in just 2. So that's my fault. So I, it's funny. I was just telling you how you should check things. And I totally didn't check my input. There's a lot of things, man. You could be one button from a bad day. I was just one channel from a bad day. That's going to be the, the name of my next album. We could do a whole other workshop on how to recover from yeah. something like that. Okay. Yeah. He just wanted to show us. Yeah. It's all planned. Because I hit it, I'm like, all right, the, the volume's out, my, my, my EQs are up, everything's there. I knew immediately that that was my, um, my input. So now... Uh, now we're good. Now we're good. Let's do that one more time. transitioning between those two tracks and I just wanted to do a little segment just because it's a short time 
and I wanted, you know, I'm utilizing everything that I would do in a full set, which is working with my stems, working with uh, at least one input, okay? Um, previously, I would have a drum pad and a gaita, so I had two inputs. In this case, I only have one. And I'm looping, I'm tapping in, and I'm working with my effects, okay? I'm also working with my tempo. I love working with tempo. That's probably where Ableton is just like still killing every other software out there. The warp feature, where you can just go, you know, I've brought everything down to 20 BPMs. Warping. So warping is an Ableton feature, and that's, I think, in my opinion, is what made Ableton where it, where it is today. And essentially what warping is, is it allows you to take a sound different in terms of how far you can go, uh, but it's a great feature. So I, I did, I, went, I started at 75 BPM, I brought it up to 90, and then I went back to 20 BPM, okay? Now, things that I'm using inside of here, so for those of you who are like, all right, how do I put this together, what do I do, um, what controller should I get, right? Well, for me, I, I use the push I used the push uh, to kind of select my channel, so I was able to say, hey, um, I'm going to, as you can see, okay, you can see I'm able to select and say, oh, I'm going to record this, oh, I'm going to record this, I'm going to record on this channel. So if you're a multi-instrumentalist, just how I brought in my um, profit, I'll use a metronome right now, I can double click, I can double click on my foot pedal, what you, what you don't need if, if you're just using the push, right? and what I mean by just using the push, like I could just push this and... But if you're using your, both of your hands and you can't re-trigger, double click, stops and goes to the next cell. If I click once, So, oh my, my uh, channel was up. I have a solo on. Yes. have I have a broken uh, there's, this is like slightly torn somewhere so like anytime a little bit of a fault I need to get a new wire like if my toe touches this part it will trigger because it like gets electricity or something it's kind of weird yeah yeah so it was just like kept on re-triggering but I, I can punch in and punch out with this and you can do layers and layers you can have uh, if you're you know, if you're really a multi-instrumentalist, kind of like those earlier guys, French Kiwi Juice and um, Younger, you know, they'll have a channel for the guitar. They go select it, punch in, record. Okay, I'm gonna layer some keys, punch in, record. Oh, I got some drums to put on top of that. how if you're an instrumentalist how do we merge this you're going to need an audio interface right what is an audio interface uh, ba, 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 ba. so well. can the zoom do the job um the zoom like a zoom yeah 
Um, it, I, I had the first one, and it does perform as an audio interface. You could use, potentially use it. So yeah. when you're with Ableton, I was wondering, like, is that enough for like, working with Ableton Live to have your Zoom? Yeah, you could do that. You can plug in your Zoom, and it can act as a, do you do that? Because I know you can, yeah. I, I didn't manage to do that. OK. Yeah, if you have one to two channels, <laughs> Seems like that's all you need. I don't need to buy it. This is, you don't. Um, if you are at the beginning, this is a great option to focus right. Scarlett 2i2 is about $130, two ins, two outs. Honestly, all you need. Okay, so if you're, uh, even if you're not, if you want a comfortable connection to your speakers, that would be the other thing, uh, other recommendation for the Zoom. I mean, that would be the minimum. I would be, a little, I would be scared to do just the Zoom personally. As a person who works with the Zoom as a field recorder, I would suggest doing that, but because really the output of the Zoom is like very delicate, it seems. I don't know. Um, audio interface is a definite. Okay, you need the, the signal to come out of it. The controller is a deep, deep world. That's on you. Okay, Lib is really cool. They're based out of I think Austin, uh, kind of a boutique company. Their stuff is not cheap. Um, Novation makes a lot of awesome stuff. I've seen people rock crazy live sets with just a keyboard, so it's really up to you on what, what it is that you want to do. For me, I started working with the push in production, and it's just something that I, it's heavy, it's annoying, it's a little bulky, um, but for me, it's, I just love the way it works with Ableton. It just helps me out a lot, is why I use it. Yeah? What are your thoughts on, uh, so, I'm going to be doing vocals in my live set. Yes. And I have a, a looping pedal. I have a, a voice touch yeah. live. And I've been kind of trying to figure out how I'm going to do it if I want to run it through the voice touch or if I want to run it just through a channel in Ableton and control it through that. What are your. It's the, it's the, is that a, like a vocal processor? Yeah. Yeah, I would run it through Ableton. And just vocal process through Ableton. Yeah, uh, vocal, well. I'm sorry. The voice is, it is a vocal process. Well, yeah, press effects. Yeah, you, you, you could. Know, tuning and shit like that. I yeah. would run that. I would run your mic into the vocal, and then that output into the input of your audio interface, and then you can capture. There's a lot of cool vocal processing and manipulation that you can do in the box. But if you already have that, I would probably just mess with that. Yeah. And record that stuff, and have that going nuts on the, the audio, and just be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions with routing and things like that? So for those of you who are trying to integrate your instruments with Ableton, do you have a better idea of how that's going to happen? I have a, I have a question. Yeah. So say you have this, you have this set up and you're adding like a vocal mic. Yeah. You would need four or two? Would you need OK, yeah. So now your audio interface, depending on what you're doing, you know, mo most audio interfaces are going to come with two ones. So if you have just two things, then you're good. If you have four channels, now you're going to have to get a bigger audio interface that has four channels, four inputs. Right? Is that what you're, in terms of channels? Well, like, I'm, so he's got this, this part has always confused me. Yeah. I'm just totally confused when it comes to, I know it's a very simple thing, but it, so you have three, you have three controllers right now that I see, right? Two controllers, one instrument. I guess okay. arguably all instruments, but okay. yeah. So, and then, and then what is this and what is that then? This, okay, so this is allowing me, so if you had like, that's why I, I was mentioning this. Oh, this is just allowing me to go, if you're plugging into a club system, you're gonna probably go into a mixer. Okay. This, yeah, this is just allowing me to go into the system. Okay, in terms of, yeah, my, my equipment, you know, what am I using? What do I have here? Okay, these are my things. Laptop, push, livid, profit, Things that were here, the PA system and the mixer. But I feel like you're maybe wondering how do you get the vocals and the tablo yes, into yes. Ableton, yeah. right, more so? And the, and the controller. And the controller. Right, all three. Well, you would plug your tablo, you probably on a mic, two mics. Like a, like a 58. Do you do or one or two? Two. 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 So two. You're, that's, you're now, I'm going to break the band. Now more. you need at least three channels. Let's just say you're gonna use one mic. Okay. You'd have one mic on your tablo. Right. That's why like this setup is minimal. And I, I apologize for not using like a lot of instruments, but just picture that my profit where I'm taking this sound. Here, let me do two channels of profit. 
Okay, I'm gonna, I just duplicated, which is gonna be a mess when it comes to my MIDI. All right, I could come here and okay, one sound. I got. I am using my push to kind of control things. So I'm able to select one of the two channels for my profit, and I'm able to then say, hey. Okay. Then I can go to my next channel. Let's pretend that's your voice. I selected it with my push. I'm going, I could keep on layering with just one instrument. Uh, that's only one channel, okay. but if it was the voice, it would still be the same process. You would write up the voice, select the channel. How I messed up in the beginning, I had seven and eight on. You have to just make sure your inputs okay. are correlating right. This allows me to capture, control, trigger. Then this guy over here allows me to take a sound. Let me, let me kill that because I don't have anything mapped to that sound yet. So then I can take my sound. It's coming in channel four. Okay, let's get some drums on that. Alright, let's actually take away the drums to noise. So this is my delay. That dub delay. Let's look at my delay real quick. Let's look at my, my delay real quick. I have this, this is where things are getting crazy. This is where now Ninja Ableton skills, building complicated audio effect racks. Um, these are things, this, this particular tool, we can email it to you. Uh, I believe your emails are in the hands of Max. Wild. Yeah, make sure you sign up. Okay. Well, I'm just letting you know, I'm, I, I want to share this with everybody. This is an audio effect rack that I built. Um, and basically, what I have is this is, so this is my filter. And it's also a kill switch. Kill switch meaning like when my delay gets crazy and I want to just dip. All right. It just allows me to do that. So this, this is actually going to uh, two parameters. It's going to my filter. That's my filter. Anyone want to guess what kind of filter that is? Huh? Yeah, okay, it's a high pass filter allowing for high frequencies. And then when I get so high, it also will shut off my delay. Now in my delay, I have one, two, three, four delay times. A half, quarter, eighth, and a sixteenth. Ableton, uh, strangely enough, does not allow you to change the delays within one delay. So if you want to go from a quarter to an eighth note in one delay, one delay, this is an echo, this is a delay uh, audio effect that has uh, from a sixteenth note to a whole bar of delay. If I want to go from a sixteenth note to one bar, I can't just do that in that one delay. It's not going to work, it's not going to respond. So I have to build this really kind of crazy thing that allows me to scroll through, I don't want to get too crazy with this stuff, um, it allows me to scroll through. You see how this guy is changing right here? So I'm able to take a delay. Okay. I can change the speed. I'm at a eighth, sixteenth note. I'm also able to change the pitch, but uh, I can take it. Fast, slow. So this 
particular delay, when you change the delay speed, it actually changes the pitch like a traditional delay. I also have reverb. I have my feedback. I'm going to turn it all the way up. It's going to get really, really gnarly. Okay. And then if I want to take it away, I can just say, hey, goodbye. Okay, so I use this a lot for transitions. I use it a lot just to kind of decorate things. And I can do that by triggering my send. So that's my A, that's to my delay. And then I have a reverb. which is the length of my reverb and I'm controlling I have a delay after this and that delay is allowing me to basically take that reverb and get like these eerie pitch shifts tools that I use heavily and rely heavily on. Let's have that go away. I just bring my decay time down. Other tools that I'm using, this thing is free and this thing is awesome. It's, men, it's made by Vengeance. Some of you might already have Vengeance sound packs. They make uh, software as well and this particular piece of software is free and I forget what, uh, I think it's the DGAM uh, 900. Um, this is just emulating a basic high pass, low pass. So all of my channels have this. This is free. You type in Vengeance uh, DGAM filter, it's free. And this thing is awesome because this allows me to um, take a sound. And even when I DJ, uh, you know, I usually just go after the filters. Uh, instead of like a low, mid, high thing. Um, so on all of the channels, we have you know, I can go this way or I can go this way. So that's on all, on all of my channels to get rid of them. In terms of processing filters on each of those channels and two uh, returns, in terms of limitations, uh, Ableton's incredibly powerful for audio processing. Um, I went too far on the other hand trying to get really crazy and for me, I just two, two returns, delay and reverb. And that's pretty traditional. Uh, in the beginning when I started with the Bad Scientist and he, he showed, you saw him on his little mixer, he was just working with delays and reverbs. Uh, these delays and reverbs allow me for transitions. It allows me to really create like really crazy soundscapes. I can also use it in very minimal ways to kind of decorate my sound. Uh, we're gonna, I wanna 
kind of reach out to you guys and see where everyone is at in terms of thinking of a live set. Yeah. I was just going to say, but we can have some questions, but can you show us a list in action in like a full track? In a full track? Yeah. I um, mean, not to put you on a spot. Yeah, I mean, what I just did okay. was, was uh, yeah, yeah. a thing, but you know what? Let's. Yeah, I would say that that was uh, that was that was the performance. Um, I'll show you my set from uh, the Knockdown Center. Um, Yes, great question. This is this is huge. Um, I I don't know what I did on this one. I don't think I did. So um, this is this is another deep deep conversation in terms of how this stuff um, is mixed or mastered. You know, if if ultimately yes, on my master channel I have a limit. End of story. What is a limiter? A limiter is a compressor with a high ratio, basically allowing you to make things really loud, of course with the sacrifice of maybe crushing things. Um, I, I, I brought both of these up. They're both efficient. If you don't have a fancy plug-in uh, limiter, you can by all means work with Ableton's limiter. Um, if your stuff isn't maybe quite as loud, you know, it depends on where you are with your own stuff. If you, if you guys are going to do a gig and your stuff isn't mastered or something, uh, the limiter could be a nice way to kind of give you that that volume of competitiveness, and you know you can compete in the loudness war, which is you know something that can be kind of important. We immediately perceive things that are louder to be better. It's just a simple fact, unfortunately. So I do have a limiter on my master channel, um, and I use Fab Filter. I have both of these on here just to show, but I use Fab Filter. Nothing crazy. I'm not doing any anything crazy here. The other one I had more gain, gain boosts. You know, I was bumping it a little bit more because things were a little bit weaker. But these are ways to just kind of make things louder. That's a new production. That would be for the live set. The live set, just to kind of bring it all together. Um, in terms of things, how they look. These are my different channels that I have.
bit of the jam that I just did for you guys, but in the transition. So that was the previous track. This is the transition. I'm not playing it. to my push and when I tap not anything like the cable or even that it will trigger it and turn things off which just happened um, so that was a transition between two tracks so really like three parts uh, you have the transition coming out of the accordion track the improv jam that I shared with you in a more kind of condensed space and then transitioning into a third track um, both of those tracks have two different instruments right uh, I could potentially, if those guys are in town, uh, if whoever's bringing me out has money to bring them in, I could put in their audio, put them to my interface, I could record them and play exactly what I'm doing with my profit. You can do that with any instrument that you have. Uh, so that, that for me is one of the, the awesome things about a live set. Uh, you were talking about like touring and wanting to have more freedom. You know, there, it's like you can do more, you can be like a band, you can be very powerful as one person two people, three people, you can just do so much because you're bringing in, you're basically like a conductor at, at a certain degree because you have like the thing that you're doing in performance and then the thing, other things that are maybe pre-recorded and how you manipulate them. So, so for example, the vocals there, so like pop out, so that, that, that's something you just sample? Um, those are, that's some, those are guys that I recorded when I was in Colombia. Yeah, but it could, could have been something that, yeah, those guys, that's, that's coming deep from Palenque, the town of Palenque, which if anyone's hip to Colombian music, is like basically the foundation of cumbia and probably one of the most preserved Afro influences uh, because of the history of this particular village, um, Palenque. Yeah, so any, any other, it's a lot, man. There's a lot of stuff. We kind of went in a lot of different directions. Um, yeah, let's have let's, some questions, yeah. Uh, real quick with the foot pedal, uh, is that something that you push native where it's two clicks? Yes, it's a hundred, yep, you, you, uh, it's one click to record, two clicks, one click to stop, two clicks to move on. Okay. I gotta change my profit, uh, inputs. I, I actually, I think after today, I'm going to, um, Buy a new pedal because this is a, it's a disaster. And I've been dealing. We've got like a couple more minutes. Yeah. For, for questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, this is this is one question that I'm answering. Yep. Yeah. No, no. Um. So yeah, one click. One click to trigger it. Yeah. If, if people are in a rush, we have time for questions. Yeah. We, so yeah. We're, we're we're start if you guys want to stay, we'll 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 do as many questions as needed. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Saying that you can 
Yeah. <laughs> it's a uh, Mercury retrograde, so I always blame that on things like that. I don't know why that happened, to be honest. I mean, that's really good, this happens all the time. Something was feeding into itself. But yeah, one click, starts to record. You play. That's one click. I can double click to stop and move. One click to record. One click to stop recording and play. Two clicks to stop and move on. And that is native, you don't have to pro program that. Yeah. So I'm just curious if I have the right gear to be able to do what I kind of want to work towards. Yes. So I have I have the folks right two by two cool. and the Akai FK Mini. Uh-huh. And uh, like in an ideal world I think I'm still, you know, lots of nine gears away, but uh, do you know Jack Garrett? Yes. So like I play ukulele and uh, to some vocals, and so I'd love to be able to have like a ukulele on one of my folks' right tracks and the vocals on the other, and have some sort of foot pedal situation for looping on the fly, and then have pre programmed drums and bass. And yeah, I mean, there's, there's options you can get, you know, loop station for me. This is my loop station. I just wow, this pedal's over here. This is so bad, man. It is. Impressive. So, ukulele, channel one, voice, channel two, pre recorded drums, pre recorded squirrel sounds, I don't know, whatever, whatever you got going on. Whatever you want, man, you know, whatever's going on. Eight, you got eight options. Do you need to use all eight? No, you don't have to. I, I started with all eight, now I'm, I'm down to four. I guess what I'm curious about is like, I'd rather not spend the money on the push right now. Yeah. Just like Serious. Um, is there a way to do it with MPT and Mini of like having a foot pedal on that and triggering through that? Or I, I don't work with that, so I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, there, there would be an alternative to getting a controller, uh, like a foot, like a, a foot pedal. Could be an option. Uh, um, MIDI mapping stuff, but it could get a little tricky. Um, people are also building templates. That would be my suggestion to you. Uh, there's some person out there, I guarantee, who built a template that would give you that freedom to map, or it's already mapped and ready to go. So there are options like the Novation, the Novation Push, or not the Novation Push, but the Novation something Launchpad. Oh, I thought I had it on. The keyboard. Yeah, it's bottom right. right. No, well, not the keyboard, but it's basically it, it's basically just buttons, and it's like a hundred dollars, and it's literally just little yeah, but it's just all buttons, kind of like this, but just buttons, um, and you can just punch in and punch out. Whether or not there's I, there's no foot pedal going into it though, um, so there are there are cheaper alternatives for sure. The Push One is also affordable and can do it, and just I think the Push One is like what you probably find one for like two hundred dollars. And that's all you need, man, honestly. Yeah, it's um, just as good. It just doesn't yeah. have like this. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, with the other questions? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, man. Um, so, what do you mean uh, computer hardware and software? Okay, so in those four videos that I showed you, this guy is using. Let's go, let's go. No, you don't need a computer. You just have a piece, one piece of hardware or multiple pieces of hardware. Anthony works with a lot of hardware, and he's like, I, you know, just kind of performing with those different electronics live. Um, you could just be basic, not basic. You could just have one thing. This would be like a sampler, okay, where you load all your sounds onto that thing, and then that's it. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm going for. Going yeah, well, you said you had the Roland. That's what that thing. No, right? I don't have the Roland. Oh. Okay, oh, that's okay, so yeah, you can just work with that. Uh, I saw any other questions, any other questions? Um, the whole stemming thing, I know that was kind of like a curiosity. I just want to show you, I know we're about to wrap up, but just, I just want to show you the stemming process. 
It's kind of tedious, it's kind of annoying. Okay, this is the entire track. You won't be able to hear it because I don't have a lot of, of the things on the hard drive. See this, all this? One kick, two claps, medieval pundits, I did steal your stems after doing your remix. You don't know about it. Okay, so this would be one great example of a stem. I have one, like all these kind of metal, metallic instruments, I would condense that into one. But let's say what, like you see all of this? All of that has been condensed into this. So I decided, I decided to put my drums with my effects because my effects were so sparse. I didn't really need to have them separate for the control. So I selected all my drums and my effects. I exported them. Um, I have a lot of different things going on my synths. That's why basic, I think I just have one thing in my bass. Uh, Ani's on this track. We can hear a little bit of it. This is, these are the stems. This guy right here. part vocal, this is another part vocal. So vocal wise we have maybe like 10 layers, it's going to be one stem. I'm going to take those 10 layers, I'm going to isolate those 10 layers I'm going to say, hey, this, 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 I export. That's a stem. I then say, oh, okay, I want all my synths. I isolate all of my synth lines. I solo them out. I export. That's my stem too. All my drums. I get them all out, and then I'll cut it up. Uh, I'll, cut, I'll cut up the stems and say, okay, <clears throat> I mentioned to you that I've learned like my, in terms of like where I'm really experimenting and doing new things are either at the beginning, the middle, or the end of the tracks, transitional moments. So I'll usually then take like those sections and, and kind of focus, like I'll have the full track, but when it comes to these sections, I might break down those individual stems so I can do more in those different sections. But that's how you would take your production, your 40 tracks, and condense it, in this case, one, two, three, four, five. So at the end of the day, you decide what you want to control and why. You might not even know, just know that you have to condense it, play with it, and then change things. Okay, start with a template, organize, then experiment, and then refine it. Uh, yeah? Well, when you take a drum rack and you want to just track each individual element out, is there a hack you that you can choose to separate the tracks out into like kick? Snares, no. You just have yeah. Individual yeah. I mean, for a drum rack, you can pull them all out, but you're gonna have to. Unfortunately, there was some like software. They're like, this will stem your tracks. I, I don't trust it. I don't know. You got it. It's a it's a tedious process. It is kind of annoying, for sure. But that's a good question. Yeah. Any other questions before we wrap it up today? My question to you is: Do you feel like you? Could possibly, the goal right now is hopefully you can go home and try to get into this a little bit more. So it, you know, I know it's hard to kind of bring that up, but if you have any questions to like that process, steps, yeah. Are there any alternatives to the foot pedal? Like, is there any other controller that you've seen that has done a similar thing? It's gonna be something with a button, right. you know. When it comes to foot pedals, there's not a lot of options out there, unfortunately. You have to keep the killing, which is like $400. There's a lot of expensive options with foot pedals. Um, there's definitely a void in the foot pedal game for me. You'd have to, the push, the push can do it. Right. Or, or something else that has buttons, like the Novation, let's, let's bring it down, like a $100 controller. Or just a keyboard with a button, you just map it, you know, you hit Command M. And that's, that's actually probably one of the biggest reasons to why I'm staying with the push is for this and also my tempo control and seeing my tempo control because I love speeding and slowing things down. Uh, just a couple of hands back there. Uh, so when you're performing live and you're jumping from song to song, yes. what's 
Was it guess, from a mechanics perspective, you're not jumping between Ableton projects. You're you're kind of like prepping all the songs. Yeah, every, yeah. Yes. In one project. Yes. Um, yes. That was one thing I had up. Uh, I think one of the other things that Adam was trying to say is there's no one way to structure a live set, and that it don't think like what can Ableton do? You know, like what what can I possibly do with this? You should think what do I need? What do I want to achieve with my live set? And then figure out how you can achieve that with Ableton. Because Ableton has so many possibilities that if you were to try to do everything in Ableton, you would go crazy. So um, just try to think, like, what do I need? What do I need Ableton to do? And then build your live set around that. And that's why every live set or every artist has an, a live set that is completely unique to them. Um, and it kind of showcases what they need and their talents and, you know, just, uh, yeah, it's very, it's a very personal thing. It is a very personal thing. Yeah. And, it, and it keeps evolving too. As you learn new things or maybe you're, maybe you're, when you travel, you have different equipment than when you are at home. So then you have to adapt accordingly. I like what Max, in terms of the beginning, start with what it is, what you need, what you can do, and, and then just go for it and things will start to focus. This is, in terms of my different choices of instruments that I'm playing or recording, my live set will always look like this. It's moving vertically, and the different colors represent different songs or different pieces of those songs, and, and I'm, I'm going down. So I'm not opening up different projects. Um, it's cool, once you build this, you can move it around like pieces, and things can, like new things will come out about, about um, and then you can like create from there. So yeah, this would be my different pieces. So one major kind of trouble point point for checking whether or not your controller is talking is you should see little yellow where it says MIDI. You should see a little yellow thing in the bottom square. In the square, showing that your controller is working. The top square. There. Top oh. right. It just came up for a little bit. Something. Something's going on. But that, that's the num first place to go. If you're not getting lights, and I wasn't getting lights, everything's on on this end, so I'm like, what's going on? That's the first place I'm going to go. And if something's not happening there, I either have to restart my computer, restart Ableton, or go even deeper and <clears throat> see what's happening here. Everything's, make, make everything's on. Right. It really, honestly, I'm a, I'm a true believer. I work with electronics enough to understand how crazy things can get. And Adam, I, yeah. let's, um, yeah. let's actually just there's, wrap up. Adam's going to be here. What's that? There's a question. Oh, question, yes. Oh, yeah, just real quick. If, like, if you were in a live set, let's say your MIDI shit stops, yes. how, how do you feel like you would like handle that? Um, it sucks, man. It, you just do. Would you just get on your laptop? And yeah, I'll go, I'll go to, I've had that happen. The first festival I played as a DJ, I literally Checked myself in the hotel the moment I got on. It my the like the motherboard burnt out. It was nuts. I just I was on my mouse. It was a silent disco too, and everyone came up to me like that was dumb. I was like, oh man. <laughs> so yeah, it sucks. 
and this is happening right now. This is not responding. I don't know why this just happened. It could be this cable. Um, I probably just have to restart the session right now. Kind of if, if you're a really big actor, or you have, you know, you have the money. You have two setups. You have two right. setups. Yeah, they do. Right. Yeah. 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 Or you have a, your phone. I've seen guys, big, you know, not big, big artists, but they'll just have their. They always have an iPhone plugged in with their playlist, and they'll just like slap that on and try to figure it out. Yeah. Another thing to do, which really helps, is if you have uh, one instrument, at least at least one sound source that is not running through Ableton but going straight into the mixer or your, your PA. Mm -hmm. So while your computer crashes, you can kind of buy some time by playing something on that, on that instrument mm -hmm. and make it into like a transition or something right, like that. Right, yeah. um, but you know what, we, we kind of have to wrap up. Adam's going to be here afterwards if you want to like ask any individual questions. Let's yes. give it up for Atropolis. <laughs> Um, you, you, you'll get my email uh, from yeah. Max, and if, if there are deeper, further, you're in the process of doing this and you need help. Um, I also created a three series blog about a uh, three like series post on like walking through this step that you can get into. Um, so yeah, just can putting you, that Where can there. people find you? On Instagram? Instagram. Atropolis? Atropolis. Yeah, Atropolis okay. on everything. Great. Uh, luckily, I was able to get that on everything. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, and it, um, Adam is also teaching the Ableton Live uh, advanced class here. Yes. So uh, if you want to learn about all this stuff, you can learn it right from the horse's mouth. Yes. Uh, a couple other announcements. The next uh, events we have coming up on December 11th, we have the Ableton Music Group here, which actually Adam is also going to be a panelist. Uh, we also have John Selway, and um, who uh, is doing something on sound design, and we have Brent Arnold who's doing a live performance with cello and looping. Uh, that's totally free, that's going to be here. Uh, it's a Tuesday night from 7 to 9 on the 11th. And then on the 16th, which is a Sunday, we'll have the next Masterclass series with Abe Duque, another um, great master. Um, he's going to be talking about mixing and mastering. So yeah, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, if you want to see us uh, about, have any questions about the courses or getting a discount, come and see me or Nacho over here. Uh, we're we're going to stick around and, and anyone who wants to tour, please come and see us. We'll show you the classrooms, we'll show you the, the view from the roof and all that. But thank you so much for coming and we'll see you next time.